Hello and welcome to tonight's presentation. I am sure if you've uh, ever been to a presentation that we've given or seen me uh, present at one of the many trade shows uh, for the MTA or uh, Money Show Traders Expos, you know that I've given solid information out to help traders improve their bottom line results. And tonight's presentation I think is going to be the, one of the best of the year and, and one that everyone should listen carefully to. There's some important information that we're going to share with you tonight. And also, um, I think that um, we're going to see several exciting situations and, and information that you can use to help you make concrete, factual trading decisions. If you've never um, explored some of the uh, information that I've taught before, then tonight's going to be a great event for you. Um, if you've seen me before, tonight's going to be a great event for you because we've got a lot of things to discuss as well as cover what's been going on in the market. So let's get started. First, take a moment to read this important disclosure. I am a registered commodity trading advisor and by law I need to submit that you know that trading is risky. Also, um, understand that uh, past performance is not indicative of future results as well as this, this information is educational in nature and it's designed to help you improve how to make informed trading decisions. It is unlawful to reproduce, distribute, or exhibit the material without um, of course permission and this is designed for you specifically the viewer. Um, tonight what we are going to do is go through what I and explain to you what is a historic event that has taken place in the futures in the commodity world and we'll get to that in just a minute. In addition we also want to uh, make you aware that we have a, what I feel for any trader new advanced intermediate I have a special offer we have a combined educational bundle package available for uh, investors that I think everyone should be mandatorily be taking this course to know how to trade if you've used my indicators on thinkorswim the PPS indicator if you use person's pivots if you're using other indicators if you struggle with volume if you're looking for a mechanical breakout system with specific rules I w with entry stops profit objectives how to trail if you're not familiar with my last conditional change uh, candle concept then this is without a doubt the one specific course you need to take to improve your trading and your bottom line results this is not just a buy a video watch it this is an educational course that we're going to offer you at the end of tonight's presentation number one but it also comes up with a follow-up mentoring session that we will do together in um, this particular trading room so we have one-on-one -on -one follow through education and we can go through uh, the material with you so if you've struggled in trading if you're looking for how to scan for specific stock trades if you're looking to figure out how and where to place stops to go with breakout trades or how to place limit orders for pullbacks what's the magic breakout or support levels uh, that we see in markets or the timing of years that we see for seasonal analysis um, all of this is covered in this um, presentation at the end and we will go through this tonight number one but at the end of our presentation you will see the special offer so um, I welcome you and let's get started okay so welcome to 2015 and yet it has been one heck of an exciting roller coaster style trading environment you've got to admit let's review what we've done so far in 2015 and man we're just like 72 hours into the year almost of trading uh, if you think about it three trading days is is 24 trading hours into the year the S&P 500 is down almost 3 percent the 30 year bond prices not yield the bonds are almost up 3 percent ironically note that the change in percentage from bonds to S&Ps about the same percentage move right um, crude oil though down another 10 percent now we could sit here and try to make trading decisions from probability statistics mathematical calculations looking at the means moving averages variance of course standard deviation we could back test strategies we use seasonal analysis if many of you have come and and read my material 
Um, if you've bought my books on Amazon over the decades, and I now can say decades, that's pretty wild. Um, you know, as part uh, co-author of the Commodity Traders Almanac for many years, uh, you know, I, I've done a lot of work with seasonal analysis in the uh, major markets and stock indices and stock sectors. We can try to prepare for a black swan event, but that's what a black swan event is all about. No one saw it coming, right? And of course, figuring random events is still is not a guarantee that you're going to make money trading. It's like you know, like the cartoons kind of saying is, can we flip a coin? I mean, if you sit there and flip a coin, I mean, what's the probability? Um, you know, is it really 50% that you're going to uh, keep getting heads? I mean, so, you know, looking at a roll of a dice, we sit there and, and, and try to figure probabilities and statistics. We do that for one major reason. We need to get an edge because the fact is nobody really does know. So we try to do prognostications. We try to say this is what's going to happen. I mean, just think even myself, I thought mid-14 we would see a peak in bond prices. I'm still kind of right because we haven't really exceeded the uh, 2014 high in bond prices. But I think for the new millennium, at least for this mid-decade right here, we are experiencing this final test phase of, the, of, a, of a potential top in, in bond prices and a low in yield. Now, we don't have a guarantee of that, so we need an edge. Now, what's happened in 2015 when we first walked into the door trading? Well, the first thing is a historic game change uh, event occurred. Whether you trade commodities or not, I want you to understand, if you trade ETFs, if you trade stocks, if you trade Exxon, if you trade Monsanto, if you've traded Potash, if you've traded Hecla Mining, if you've traded a lot of commodity-based stocks and ETFs, this is something that is a historic game changer and you might not be aware of it. But for the first time ever in history, the Chicago Mercantile Exchange and the, and the commodity exchanges are charging traders for quotes. Now, the good news is it's been a lot of confusion confusion for s different people and so I think what the the main fact is and where this would really uh, integrate and and hurt people if you want to find more information you can please visit the CM and I posted the link here just go to cmegroup.com market data distributor files blah 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 um, Bottom line, if you're a professional trader deemed to be either an FCM, a, an IB, a broker, a, a hedge fund manager, a, just a startup hedge fund, you're going to be paying $85 per exchange fee. That's $85 times four, which is $340 a month. If you had tr an account prior to March last year, your grandfathered in, it's about half of that, which is about $172. As a non-professional, which most people are, a speculator, you're going to be charged $5 per exchange, and here's the trick. It's capped out at $15. So if you only wanted the CME data, you'll pay $5 in quote feeds. Now, there's even more because it gets, it gets a little bit more confusing. There's the bid-ask market quotes, and then there's the dome quotes. And we're talking about dome quotes because most people want depth of market quotes. So why am I telling you this information and what does this have to do about anything well a lot actually if you're a hedge fund or a startup hedge fund and you've got five guys in your office all in all of a sudden you need quotes on all of these top four markets now you've got an office fee that instead of your rent your electricity everything else now you got a fixed cost that just went up a little bit more so startup hedge funds might be a little bit of a problem right um, and so that's one of the things, and then as a broker, if you own an, a, a brokerage firm, a small introducing brokerage firm, they're going to have to pay per broker's terminal, they have to pay those fees. And that will come out of a broker's pocket. So these are things that, that are not really being thought through. We're not sure how the ramification is, but I'll tell you what, this is what I kind of see, the cause and effect. Future commission merchants, FCMs, introducing brokers IBs and even new startup hedge funds will be charged per unit 
individuals holding multiple accounts. So let's say, you know how they always say, hey, always have a backup account in case, you know, connectivity or your brokerage firm goes down or something like that. You always have, you know, <clears throat> a backup plan. And I think everyone should. I've been teaching that for, for decades and, and, and actually have had multiple accounts across the spectrum of, of brokerage firms. Many of you know this. Now, I will be charged per account with the different brokerage firms. So if you have a brokerage ac account at one FCM and another one somewhere else, you're going to be charged that fee. So you have to say, well, you know, maybe I only want to get delayed quotes and you got to figure this out. But here's the, the bottom line, the historic game changer. It's going to increase the cost of doing business. And here's what I'm afraid of, all right? How this affects the most important element of uh, an 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 aspect is right here a startup new hedge fund you know we see people in the hedge fund industry come and go and people are always trying to start up you know getting into managed money now why is that important well there is a report that you guys know that I utilize the commitment of traders data and it's incredibly informative and useful and I'm going to share this with you right now why do I need the commitment of traders data well, from a psychological standpoint, if you think about it real carefully, if you're not sure what this report is, it's don't move. I'm going to show you why this is important. It really does share with us who's in control of the market, and it breaks it down into three categories. Ironically, it breaks it down to hedge funds, the large speculators. It breaks it down to commercials, those who are end users, either producers or end users who are going to make or take delivery of a product and they use the commodities to hedge their risk in the cash market and then there's this individual speculator and so we use the commitment of traders data to help give us some better maybe potential and edge better market analysis it also helps us give an ability to anticipate market opportunities and it gives us trade decision information based on one key element that I think every one of you want to get an edge facts we need facts not opinion let's share some facts with you right now many of you have seen my presentations before and I always kind of talk about my 12-step program to, to help determine better analytical skills and, and you are familiar with my uh, famed PPS buy sell triggers it's available on multiple platforms candle patterns we all go down the line person's pivot indicator it, it's it's a, a very useful tool to help determine direction and then of course support and resistance for most time frames and I use chart patterns and wedges and seasonal and cycle analysis volume analysis very key and critical as I'll share with you again tonight I have a little person's a little histogram that I have and, and a little uh, exclusive indicator at TradeStation and I use relative strength and 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 when I say relative strength, I don't mean like the RSI indicator. I mean relative strength comparing one market to another, like comparing Coca-Cola with Pepsi, comparing the S&Ps to the Russell. Relative comparative strength. We also call it pairs or spread trade analysis. But look at this one, number nine. Number nine has always been there. Commitment of trader data for futures. It's very important. Of course, I use breadth analysis for stock indices last conditional change specific chart patterns and last but not least money management and position sizing guidelines so let me focus on number nine for just a minute why is this important take a look at this friends this non-commercial category describes what is a hedge fund so we don't want to lose hedge funds do we we need hedge funds they're still speculators not every hedge fund makes money. I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to show you this in just a second. Look at the, then you have the commercials and you have the non-reportable positions. Now this is just the Dow Jones Industrial Average Futures. So just to show you something which is very important of what's going on in the market right now. What has happened in the market? Remember I just began the presentation showing you what the percent changes of the markets were. Bonds up, stocks down, crude down. Well, if you're a hedge fund, you're not necessarily just in one market. Unless maybe you're a market maker or you're just specializing one one area. But most hedge funds are diversified amongst 
asset classes, which means they might be in S&Ps, they're probably in crude oil, they could be in bonds, most likely in gold, soybeans, etc., etc. So let's take a look at the market condition right now and see what's going on. Hedge funds. Look at this commitment of trade of data and see what it shows. It's, it's boxed in force. This is as of December 30th, the close of business, December 30th. Here are the positions. The non-commercials, the head funds, long 35,000, short 19. So what do you get? A net 30% of that open interest number, the hedge funds were long. Huh, interesting. This is the E-mini S&Ps. This is a, a, a kind of a, a, an interesting number as well because I want to share with you this open interest level right here, 3267 about three months ago, that was 4500 So we really dropped since September the open interest, the amount of participation in the market, especially as the stock market has been rising since that October low when the market shot up that open interest has declined but here's what's the most amazing part about this all right when you take a look at this look at the longs of the small speculators and the shorts all right the longs and the shorts they're long 259 they're short 256 it's like a net neutral and and here's if we look at this line right here percent of open interest it says 7.9 versus 7.8. So even by looking at not the overall net position, but by looking at the percent of open interest to the uh, percent of, of net long or short to the open interest, it shows pretty much neutral, 7.9, 7.8. All right, that's the small speculator. Let's focus on the pink box, non-commercials. This is the hedge funds. Why do we need the hedge funds? We don't want to lose the hedge funds. Funny thing is, if you look at this number, they are long E-mini S&Ps, 474 versus 339. They were net long 14.5% of that open interest in the S&P 500 futures since December 30th. So what does that tell us? Well, since December 30th, the market has not just gone down by 1%, 2%. We've seen about a 90-handle decline since December 30th, and it shows that the hedge funds were long S&Ps. Do you think if you had 90 handles long, would you be still able to maintain your positions and not go on a margin call? But wait, there's more, so sit back. And this is why it's important that we, we understand what the element is on hedge funds when it comes to looking at this data. Now this is the bond market. Now many of you might not trade bond futures and as you can see that's a fact because look at the open interest is, and it's so sad because I started trading bonds back in 1984 and it is so sad to see only 524,000. Gosh, we need interest rates to go up again. You know, wouldn't it be nice to just have a, a CD and make 4% on your money every year by just having it in the bank again? You remember those years? You know, that was like 02. You know, uh, not it wasn't just 12 years ago when we had some kind of an interest rate. But meanwhile, back on subject, not a lot of small speculators are in the bond market. But this is the category of small speculators. You know, give one for the Gipper because the small speculator... Look at this, 88,000 on the short side, but 115,000 on the long side. The small speculator is long bonds. Who's short? We need these hedge funds, don't we? Because the hedge funds, they were not by a huge margin, but 12% of that open interest, these guys from a psychological edge, they are on the short side of the market. So it goes to show you that maybe not all the time are hedge funds right, and this time around, hedge funds have been caught with their pants down, literally, because since 1230, that's right here, the market was at 144. Look at that significant move. So uh, you want to start adding these numbers up. This is the 29th. This is the 30th. From the 30th to today's high, that small little move out of nowhere 
is approximately, if you think about it, from around 144 to around almost 149, a $5,000 move on a one contract in bonds. So you've got almost a $5,000 move in the S&Ps, 90 handles, $4,500. You almost got a $5,000 move sitting right here in your face on a bond trade that you just didn't see coming because the hedge funds, according to the government report, it shows us what the side of the position, the net side of the position each trade category is in. If you noticed, in the S&Ps, small speculators, they didn't get wiped out in this. This is not a small speculator. They're, they were like net neutral. In the bonds, the small speculators are long, for gosh sakes. So let's look about what probably is what you and I see as the most, what one of the most popular, if not the most popular headline news across the globe. I don't care where you go, everyone's talking about what a relief gas prices are. True or false? Everyone's talking about it. Everyone says, man, did you see gas prices? Oh my God, they're down another dime. Everyone's talking about, and, and you know, it's kind of interesting because when we start looking at this little report, I want you to stare at these numbers, guys and girls, because this is why we need the hedge fund community because it just shows that not all the time are they right by the way look at the general public in crude oil 91,000 long versus 80,000 short in other words 3.9 percent of the open interest long 3.4 of the open interest short they're hardly in the market the small speculator not really in the market they probably did the wise thing and sat it out for the holidays waited for the new year to begin and let's get giddy up and going however the hedge funds look at this number 18 percent of the open interest and that is two million three hundred forty three thousand eight hundred and forty two contracts of WTI New York mercantile exchange crude oil Bob Pod said oil that's the number one thing on headline news that's right I don't know if this makes sense to you, but look at this. If everyone's student body is long, look at that 4 to 1 number. I mean, that is huge. So this is as of December 30th. You following me? They're on the wrong side of the stock market, wrong side of the bond market, and it's not just the S&Ps. They went with a Dow, too. But they're hugely as you can see not that that's correct grammar but hugely wrong and long one of the highest that I remember in an awful awful long time that percent of open interest 18 percent that my friends is a pretty dramatic number these guys the hedge funds we're banking that crude oil would stop. So what do you think? When you hear on the news, when is the low going to come in? Here's my guess. Now, this is as of 1230. And here's how we utilize this information to our advantage. Right now, there's a lot of talk. Now that crude oil has gone from almost over 100 bucks back early uh, this spring to now it's breached 50. Now everyone's an analyst coming out of the woodwork saying it's going to even 40. Okay, so we're going all the way down to zero, right? All of a sudden now. Well, the funny thing is, let's take a look at crude oil and say, from the 30th, where was this market? So that's as of the 30th, right? So if you think about the 30th, from 54 to 48, that's a $6,000 move. So they were probably building a large position in this consolidation area right in here it'd be my guess this was an area in here I'm not gonna say they bought the high and I'm not gonna say they bought the low but building up into the 30th this is where they started to amass you know probably buy some in here hedged added some more scaled in here so I'm thinking what happens if you're long from the 30th right and the 30th is as you can see on the chart right here so if you're at that price level and we go to this price level, and that's just a small, almost $6,000 move against you. How many different positions can you be in and get 
and sustain the types of move that we're seeing. So I wanted to put it in perspective of why is it important to see the hedge funds? Remember, not all hedge funds make money. You guys know that. You'll read the papers. You're going to see hedge funds performance in 2014. I'm going to bet, sure as I'm sitting here, I don't have to bet. I know a majority of you guys, I know a majority of you guys exceeded and beat the market pundits last year. I know that. I know I already see a handful, a couple handfuls of people that I know had good years last year. I see your names. And if you want to say you beat the market, you can feel free to, you know, chime in so people can see and, and maybe we take an independent poll. I'm going to bet that it's the hedge funds that are having the biggest problem right now. And I think that's why we need the commitment of traders data. So here's how I use this information, and here's how you can use it. Number one, we use the um, commitment of traders data. It helps to confirm who's holding what in the market. And we can determine, as I just shared with you, we can determine a price move from the last report. It kind of helps to do what? Calculate that pain level. If we know that the hedge funds are long from a certain date on the close of 1230 and you see where's the market today you can kind of figure out well were they just long or did they hold along from the prior week and of course they held longs from the prior week so we can kind of use this information as a fact not opinion that the public's not in this trade it's mostly the hedge funds and when the hedge funds have multiple trades that they're in and they're wrong on for the majority. Now think of it this way. Some are making money and a lot are losing money. One to four in crude oil, 100,000 short, 400,000 long. You do the math. More losers than winners. So at what point does that capitulate? How much pain can one entity take? I mean, I got to admit, a $6 move in crude oil in since December 30th, is an enormous amount of pain to take. Now, I want you to understand, when I took a look at this, I want to share this with you. Remember, I kind of teach people how to use this information um, efficiently. Uh, number one, I have the commitment of traders data that I use the futures and the options combined. Why? Because what if I'm long the futures, but I bought a put for production? I'm not really net long, am I? So therefore, I like to utilize the commitment of traders data as more of a statistical reference of who's holding what in the market. And that way, it helps give me a guide. Think of this logically of whether or not, combined with seasonal analysis, we can spot potential reversals. Now, what you don't know, or maybe you do, but... Towards the end of this month, a funny thing typically happens between the end of this month and the first week of February. About the best time of the year to go long crude oil is that week. Now, you got to give or take a week or so. And, of course, the conditions with crude oil, I think that this technical damage in what we're seeing here might just be forced margin call liquidation. I mean, I understand OPEC, and I understand oil production, and I understand fracking. But there's also that capitulation when you get into the investment world where people are long substantially, and then all of a sudden, they have to sell because they're losing money, and they're forced out of their position. And what happens is you get this cascading watershed factor and that's why people scratch their head and say hey, I don't understand this well if you look at the facts I think it so it makes a more logical sense the reason we're going down is people are getting their 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 accounts liquidated I mean in just a very short order of time having that size of a net long position in a downtrend this is a killer and this is going to be very tough to trade out of starting 2015 for a lot of hedge funds in fact we probably won't have a lot of hedge funds that are in this they've probably got blown up here's the problem if they got blown up now they gotta start all over again new accounts and guess what they gotta do pay the CME new exchange fees so they're gonna get slapped with a little salt in the wound on top of it all 
I don't know if that's a little humor, but sorry. I mean, that's the facts, right? I think that we get an edge, and as I started the presentation tonight, I think, number one, using my PPS indicator combined with other tools, it adds that edge if you can understand that once we see that technical pressure, that's what we have to start to guesstimate. What is the threshold pain level that you say, enough's enough, I'm out? Is it $2,000, $4,000, $6,000, $8,000 per contract amongst several different markets? Do you see what I'm saying? In other words, if you're losing $6,000 in crude, and $5,000 in bonds, and all of a sudden, in three days, you have no chance to, to unwind that leverage because you're getting massive losses from all sides all at once there's only one recourse you got two recourses wire more money in or liquidate the position and that's what the media would consider technical pressures because they don't want to say oh yeah guy's getting forced out of his trade their their margin call liquidating them right when when the money runs out of the account they don't wait around for the wire to show up they liquidate you and then they say when the money hits the books you can get right back into the market my friend and that's the facts of trading so the commitment of traders data really does help us confirm who's holding what and it gives us um, a great edge in understanding the dynamics behind the market now if if hedge funds were short and the and the small speculators held a very uh, a small short position I would be very concerned that this market can go a lot further to the downside but at this point it's kind of the opposite I'm more concerned that the markets probably coming closer to the bottom because once we wipe out that hedge fund liquidation that net long position is wiped out I'm thinking once there's no more selling we could see a kind of a short sharp potential reversal in the market it wouldn't surprise me you know to wake up and, and see crude oil within the next week or two up five six bucks I don't think anyone sitting here that has been watching the markets would be surprised one iota to see a six dollar move go up in crude oil in one day I don't think anyone would be surprised it's just how it would feed on itself right we'd all be sitting there going like oh my god maybe four dollars and eighty cents or somewhere around there we could potentially see you know a, an eight to ten percent move from $48. If you think about it, a 10% move from $48 is a $4.80 move. Big deal. It's just going to happen real fast. Once the sellers are wiped out, buyers step in. So this is where you can start to anticipate market opportunities. And that's what I wanted to share with you. Now, that's not the only trick up our sleeve, but I wanted to share with you some uh, ways that I use and tools that I use to anticipate market opportunities all right now I'm I don't want to see uh, the hedge funds go away I don't want to see people be charged to the point where they don't trade commodities and just trade ETFs we still want to be changed tra uh, uh, trading the commodity markets because we get terrific information like this commitment of traders data free of charge but if people aren't trading in the commodity market then they can't get the data or if there's less traders in a market it's not going to be as reliable you might as well just trade no joke milk futures okay so that is one of the things that I want to say you know this last bullet point here um, when I say there's other tricks up our sleeve, you know, I talked, I did a presentation a few weeks ago, last week, two weeks ago, in fact, and I talked about the dogs of the year. Negative performers into the middle of December tend to rebound sharply after the new year. You know, once we see that tax credit selling pressure abated. One of the trades that we did, many of you may have been around for it, we uh, tweeted out, in fact, we tweeted to buy Twitter. Uh, and it, we had a nice little trade in Twitter. In fact, we did two strategies. We went with a long call strategy in Twitter. And we went with a credit put spread, the 36.34, for around 62 cents. We wanted to get through the holidays and just look for a little theta decay. Today we covered that position. We tweeted that out. So we tweeted out getting into the trade. We tweeted getting out of the trade. So for those that had followed me on Twitter, I hope you enjoyed that. Um, you know, and this was one of the strategies and the trades that we actually put out. Um, we also put out a few others that I think are lining up, and I want to share them with you tonight in case you weren't around, because I think this is going to give us some good opportunities going forward. Now, 
Some of these are not, obviously, uh, commodity-related. This one is an old-school favorite that many of you may find uh, an interesting or boring. I'm not sure whichever you want to say it. But this white hash line represents the last few years, okay? And if you notice what's happened with Sears, it goes down into the end of the year, and it rallies. It goes down into the end of the year, and it rallies. It goes down into the end of the year, and it rallies. We went down down into the end of the year and eh, not really but we are moving lower into the end of the year and we're just waiting for a little PPS buy signal this is an interesting setup to me because between the end of the year December 31st and April 1st we've seen traditionally this type of, of movement in the retailer Sears now why I think this year I want you guys to pay attention to this all right as you can see this is a weekly chart this is Sears, and this is using TOS. We do not have an orange or blue arrow. Orange is a sell signal here. This is actually kind of an interesting pattern, and there's a several different ways to play this. A, I would look for a breakout, a close above that level right there. On a breakout, I would look for that, that move to the upside, or I would wait to see if we get a PPS buy signal. Okay, we're near support. In in light of how the overall stock market's traded, the fact that Sears hasn't really done anything in of itself speaks wonders. Now, here's what I think's going on. Um, this year, and you may remember last year, I don't want to get too fundamental, but a lot of people moved into apartments rather than buy new homes. And I think this is the year as people start to save money to get out of their apartments into a home, you know, you get a 12-month lease. So if you sign a, a, an apartment lease in April, you're not getting out until April, but you're going to start shopping for a home and you're not going to renew that apartment lease. And I think that that's one of the things that we, we might be seeing. What's one of the components that people do? They go to Sears. But needless to say, it has strong seasonal analysis and there's a little volume indicator that we use over here, OBV, that I like to teach people how to use. Note that the direction of the on balance volume indicator and notice the direction of price they're converging volumes kind of going up price is sort of moved down so it's actually spring loaded for a potential move and i'm not saying the stock's going to 100 but boy if you got a breakout above say this uh, 30 let's call it 35 level right you get a breakout above 35 and at least come back up to test this high this high in here right I mean, that's a lot of room to make a couple bucks. So moral of the story is you want to set your alerts for that one. And I wanted to just, again, if you were here with me a couple weeks ago, I just want to follow with you for some of this. This one was another one we had on the list was J.C. Penny. Now, I know you probably, J.C. Person, come on. There's all kinds of great stocks out there. We got all these biotechs flying all over the place. You know, the commodity markets are moving, and you got us looking at this stuff. Again, I don't care how you make money. It's what is the risk, and, and if you can define your risk, and what's the probability, and what kind of capital does it take to make the money. That's what's really important. Because anyone can say, hey, look, uh, let's buy gold. But if you've got to risk $5,000, man, that's not a good trade to me. Low risk with a good position and high probability. And that's what I like to teach people, these high probability setups. Now, J.C. Penney's, uh, by the way, just from a uh, uh, you know recent history, we have seen, and that's what this white line hash represents. We have seen, except for last year. Last year was the one year it didn't work in four years, right? But here's, if you notice, one common denominator. One common denominator. At the beginning of the year, it went down. You didn't get into it until you saw the PPS buy signal, and then you got the late stage rally. That's the interesting component. Now, right now, we don't quite have that going, or do we? And that's one of the things that I wanted to share with you. Because today, while the stock market, I don't know, this is pretty sneaky, while the stock market plunge straight down as we saw the hedge funds net long the S&Ps and the Dow little lowly Mr. JC stupid penny stock a $6 stock was actually up almost 2% today 
All right. So I would say if we can clear, and one of the other interesting elements is somebody doesn't think that this is that stupid of a stock because you can start to see a little bit of accumulation in the volume. Okay. So I think being up today, I mean, 12 cents is not a big deal relative. It's a $6 stock. But I'm talking about, you know, if everyone loved it at eight bucks, then they gotta love it at six. And the fact that the relative strength outperformed the market speaks well and gives you an edge knowing that almost in the last four years, JC Penny between January and April has gone up. So I think that's one of the things that we gotta anticipate is the duration. Now what we need is to understand is there a price pattern or is there something that can give us a measured move, an objective, and how can we trade that and what what's our risk? Those are the things that we talk about. Now, the person's pivot indicator, and it's a very powerful tool, and it helps uncover that predetermined support and resistance. Um, you know, we combine it with different patterns. Uh, some of my favorite patterns, many of you know about the high closed OG, the low closed OG, you know, looking at how to trade M tops and, of course, W bottom formations, and, of course, the powerful wedge formation, which we actually have a little twist to that. It's a very, very um, unique way of trading the the wedge formation. Um, many of you who took our trading course and we just offered, we had that mechanical trading system. If you haven't gotten through to that part yet, you better hurry because I think we've got a lot of setups coming and you're gonna see exactly how to trade, how to define your profit objective and where to place your stop. So if you got that course just two weeks ago, you better get on it. And I'll talk about that a little bit more at the end of tonight's presentation because it is extremely in fact effective. In fact, if you bought that trading course and you haven't really looked at it, there's there's a little something here. Um, now, I did not, for the record, take this trade, but it was the setup that's very powerful. This is a, a, a biotech company called Kite. Um, and all the way up, this thing just you know popped off the charts because it popped off, uh, unfortunately, um, right during the New Year's Eve, which I have to admit, I had my uh, uh, my my guard down. I was um, on vacation for that week. But needless to say, we're getting a lot of these types of setups in the market. And I think with the hedge funds out of the way in in the energy complex, my friends, I think this is a pattern that we're going to have to be looking for um and, and start realizing we're going to have to start waiting and looking for some, some buy setups. When I talk about other patterns, I've been very, I started this little pilot program at the beginning of last year where I started to send tweets out about trades. This photo, the insert, is exactly the photo you can go to our website if you go to PersonsPlanet.com. Maybe I'll pop it up just for um, a look-see here. If you go to our website, PersonsPlanet.com, you can go down to the tweets here. Um, I think you can go even click on the, the, the Twitter logo. Um, like I say, click on the Twitter logo or not. Um, and you can, there it goes. Okay, so um, Twitter. Uh, this was a trade we actually tweeted. It's kind of funny. Um, we tweeted to do this strategy before the holidays. Um, this is another uh, thing that we're talking about, a the declining wedge, but we wait for breakout, which we didn't get yet. Um, anyway, I put out some nice things uh, every once in a while, but uh, mostly what I'm doing is, as you can see here on December 23rd, uh, Twitter trade. We're taking profits on the long calls. We did two strategies. We went long a call, just an outright trade at, for Twitter before the holidays, and then we held a credit put spread for some theta decay in New Year's Eve. So this was, uh, you know, just a, you know, an FYI what we're doing and and going through. And you can go through and see some of these tweets that we've put out. Very informative. This is one that we put out back in September that talked about a broadening top with divergence in the advanced decline ratio line and as you can clearly see it worked out it was you know some really good stuff we also you know almost every trade I'm going to show you you've see, probably seen before were stuff that we tweeted out but they're patterns that we use in combinations with other indicators if you note here when we talk about the PPS indicator 
or the patterns such as the high closed doji or and I tell you I like to look for combinations of buy signals near monthly support this was the Russell we actually went long we were short the market on the way down and we reversed and went long not only did we do that in the trading room we actually sent a tweet out um, another on a side note I'm gonna say a lot of you guys if you've never been to one of my webinars before if you're using a volume indicator if you're using the volume histogram I just want to share this with you if you notice that volumes going up and this indicator OBV is going down many people might get fooled into thinking hey this trend has got more to go and the funny thing is if you note right here there's a big change that occurred in the market whereas the volume might make you think that the market's going to continue to go down but the OBV is confirming that actually price is gaining positive volume momentum. Anyway, this was another HCD. It was a long trade that we uh, tweeted out back in October. And, you know, there are so many patterns, just a few of them that I like to focus in on. Like, again, low closed doji at monthly resistance, uh, low closed dojis at person's pivots. I mean, so looking at patterns and looking at that PPS indicator and that's that buy sell um, indicator it's commonly referred to on thinkorswim platform as the PPS indicator basically it's a momentum indicator and we use that in conjunction with other tools um, we had some pretty stellar calls in the in this past year many of you probably remember some of this stuff like back in September I remember we we were a little early on the Q puts and I got a little grief from some people because everyone's like John we're in the Q puts when's this thing gonna go down and we got our answer we actually added to spider puts and then we reversed and we went with IWM calls I bet you there's a handful of people here tonight that remember we had an open house last quarter you remember we did the analysis on Qualcomm and Whole Foods? Whole Foods had what? About a 10%, 12% move after earnings. And we had that nailed down. Plus we did that Amazon trade. And we had that little Apple that we tweeted out to be looking to sell at 120. Um, that was pretty much the peak for a little while there, you got to admit. And then this, we just did that little Twitter trade uh, that we just covered. When I tell you that there is some really good ways of defining price moves it's not just the arrow and the momentum it's a combination of direction of volume this is what led us to understand that there was potential buying ahead of and who in their right mind was thinking of going long q logic but we did and q logic was like one of the biggest earning surprises last quarter um in addition, JDS Uniface, we were talking about this, and I'm so proud of this because I had, like, when I came up with this on my scans, when we had that PPS buy signal scan, I'm telling you right now, truthfully, I, I'm not bragging. I'm, I'm laughing because I just had, a, like, a, a senior moment. I forgot who the hell they were. I'm like, JDS Uniface, yeah, what do they do again? I mean, it was like a blast from the past of, of, of 2001 all over again, right? But yet... Who in their right mind wants to trade JDS Uniphase when you got Triple D and all these sexy savvy? You got Tesla moving. You got biotech names flying all over the place. And here we have a low risk, high probability, incredible move based on both the momentum indicator and volume patterns. Um, that, to me, I think was a really important um, uh, killer uh, combination and it just went one after the other and just to go through whole food mark just as a reminder whole food market gave us a buy signal a week before the earnings came out the volume analysis just to share with you guys right look at the direction of price look at the direction of the volume bars look at the direction of price price is actually if you load look here closely with me all right because this is really a, a tip off do you see can you clearly see yes or no clearly see how the trend of the price over this weekly again this is bottom ones a weekly chart because this is very important if you don't think I'm gonna be using the same techniques in the next couple weeks as we enter earnings season you better think again look and you better be prepared for these types of setups because they're coming baby but look at that price direction of the downside explain to me why this yellow line is pointing up well before the price surged 
All right? That, to me, is a dead ringer giveaway. And are there ways to trade that, and how can we anticipate? So this particular earnings season, we are locked and loaded with volatility already. I mean, we've wrung out some excesses out of the stock market. We've got earnings event around the corner. I mean, here was the one in QCOM, which, you know, the funny thing about that QCOM is that, you know, we weren't bullish on QCOM. We were bearish. We're sitting there going, you know, the stock, this price has gone up, and the volume's not gone anywhere. But yet, the same thing on a daily basis. The tr market's trending higher, and the volume's going down. It's not trending up. It didn't break out. There was no breakout with volume. And we also had that little PPS sell signal, and of course, bang, Qualcomm moved down. What's interesting about this, this was not luck. It was not about flipping a coin. It wasn't looking at probabilities. The interesting thing about Qualcomm is if you go back and you look at that November time period, Apple was going up and everyone thought Qualcomm would go up with Apple because Qualcomm being a provider, you know, a part provider to a degree to Apple. And guess what? The opposite happened. And I mean, that was a, that was a pretty decent analysis combining the two indicators. Cisco, Man's most hated technology company, John Chambers. You got to admit, this guy hasn't performed. You've heard about Cisco. But you know what? We didn't do too bad with Cisco. Guys in this room, I have students in this room right now. You guys know, we. this is stuff that was live, and we actually tweeted this stuff. So before it happened, which is a lot different. That's why I say when I did that Twitter program, it was a pilot program. I wanted to see if people would follow what we were saying and see if people could understand, you know, by the way, if you understand about Cisco, we have a bullish HCD pattern. Uh, you know, all you had to understand was HCD and know what it means. Uh, it's a good heads up. Amazon. Now, this was a great trade that we took from a, a, a buy high close doji. Remember, I just talked about we look at different patterns, right? The high close doji pattern. This isn't from 1999. This isn't from 2004. This was just a few, I mean, literally not more than 10 weeks ago, right? And and so by looking at how we can analyze the market, are there going to be trades out there using this style of analysis? I think it's going to continue this year because we are seeing the volatility, and I think that this is the, the analysis that seems to be working in the markets right now. It's really gelling. And, you know, the interesting thing about this, um, this chart that I want to share with you again, if you guys have been trading using simple volume bars I mean I don't know what the hell that tells you but if I taught you how to look at this indicator down here correctly and let's just pretend pretend for a moment that this blue line is pretend its price at this point in time did is it making a series of higher highs and higher lows it is right and, and if I lied to you and said, oh, by the way, this is price, and it's breaking out, and it just broke out, and now we should see an expected little move to the upside, right? Um, if you think about it, look where, from a line perspective, when did the breakout in volume happen? When did it take out the old highs, right? It happened here. It didn't happen up there. And what is this stuff telling you? What is this volume histogram sharing with you? If you have any idea, please let me know because I have no clue. All of this tells me it's average volume, but what this on-balance volume indicator shares with me is that what it is supposed to is that volume precedes price. And we not only saw Amazon. Now, it didn't stay there, but just for the record, Amazon went up to around 340 one, I think it was 41 or 42. What we did is we scaled out of that trade. All right? So that was an, an excellent pickup when no one saw it coming. It was based on the indicators and what I'm sharing with you tonight. All right? And the reason I'm doing that is because we had a game-changing event. And I don't want to see people get dissuaded because of a small fee in the markets. I want you guys to, to embrace the industry that we have because, man, if you can learn to wait patiently for the right setup and apply at least some logical position sizing guidelines, 
we are seeing some fantastic moves, and I'd love to share with you how to do that because I'm telling you right now, we got some amazing moves coming, and they've been happening. I mean, myself personally, I mean, we've done almost every single trade that you could see. It was busy, and we traded multiple times through the year. Um, you know, I've got a couple uh, ones out there. We eked out a nice one in MGM, and by the way, I want to point out, MGM, uh, we got about six, seven weeks where you want to start paying attention to the casinos again, kids. I forgot to mention that. That'll be another webinar we'll do later. But uh, a lot of these trades, almost all these trades, Apple, the Amazon, uh, the Russell, um, QLogic, TLT, Twitter, uh, Whole Food Mart, we tweeted this stuff out before we placed orders, and we did that in that social media, what I call the pilot program to help individual investors. You know, that, that little Twitter um I think what we did is we got up to almost 44,000 people following um, this uh, event. So I must be doing something right. And, you know, every once in a while, okay, it's not business. But we were in Las Vegas for New Year's. I went to see the Michael Jackson. I'm an old deadhead. That's no secret. Love the dead. Love the stones. I'm a rock and roll kid. But I got to tell you something. If you go to Vegas, go see this Michael Jackson show in Las Vegas. It's a must-see. Um, it's at... Uh, uh, Mandal Mandalay Bay. So uh, it is pretty uh, amazing, uh, 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 good stuff. So I will give out besides, you know, the typical stuff, um, I will give out some specific trades and things of that nature. So I just wanted to bring that to your attention. I'm not all just business. I like to give out some some version of, of some good stuff in life. Now, for you guys that saw me a couple weeks ago, I made a tremendous offer, and it was this special trading course, and we had a lot of people take advantage of it. We're starting the new year. Um, by the way, yes, we were at the MGM party. Kelly Clarkson was uh, there at the MGM party. Um, that was very nice. I want you guys, if you're really serious about getting an edge in the markets this year, I have this brand new study course. Um, it is going to be, and it was, we're putting it back for 189 it's how to trade the PPS indicator it's approximately four hours of instructional information it is a lot of details talking about the best time frames to combine using the PPS indicator combined with person's pivots the practical purpose for why we have those moving averages overlaid on prices how we use the projected support resistance to target the market trend, why we use the pivot point level in of itself to define trades, how to set up and scan for trades using PPS. Now, if you don't have TradeStation, if you're a Thinkorswim customer, this is ideal for you guys to scan for trade opportunities using the PPS indicator. It's it's without a doubt um, right there. Learning how to run the scans is fabulous. It also tells you not just the scans, uh, what comes up, but how you can look for scans and see what the sector analysis is doing. So all of a sudden, if you start to scan for buy signals, and all of a sudden you see two or three stocks you're not familiar with, you can just look them up. Maybe they happen to be REITs. By the way, this is the information we shared yesterday. While the stock market was crashing yesterday, the uh, real estate investment trust, there's just a couple dozen were all popping um, and, and just taking off. So not all stocks are going down. I think what we're seeing is a little, believe it or not, some rotation going on. And I'm not convinced that you know it's the end of the world. Uh, I'm not all that outright bearish right here, still just for the record. Um, we also use which technical indicators work best in conjunction with PPS. A lot of people have come to me saying they use Bollinger Bands, they like to look at the bands, and they look at the squeezes. And I know, John, I've used Bollinger Bands for now two decades. How to integrate Ichimuchu cloud charts. That's also kind of an interesting component of how the PPS integrate grates with the, these two forms of, of, of analysis. And I go through very in-depth teachings on those two points so if you're interested my favorite aspect of what we went through tonight was how to integrate the volume analysis with the PPS indicator and again how to use comparative and analysis trick using PPS with cash and futures markets once again futures markets 
futures. If you're a spider trader, if you're trading OEX, man, you got to still use the futures information. Now, this was the course for using PPS combined with person's pivots. For more advanced traders, we also have what I think everyone should get and learn how to trade this mechanical breakout system. This is the PPS breakout system strategy. Similar to Wedge, but it gives instructions for placing entry orders, stop loss, setting profit objectives, instructions for scale outs, instructions for trailing your stops. We talk in detail. First off, you got to know what the last conditional change, what we consider to be the LCC method, the last conditional change. Last conditional change is very important in this methodology, and you have to understand how to do this right. So not only do I teach all of that and how to use that method for end of day and weekly time frames and how to set up for buying and selling strategies, but we look to see how to apply this breakout method for options trading because I'm gonna tell you something that is dynamic how to select the right strike price and how to select the right expiration date you know we just did a, a, a trade today in USO and I think from a, a very small position in USO I want everyone I'm gonna leave you with this too um, there's a couple if you if you do this there's a couple things that you may want to also examine in crude oil very shortly and keep your eye on it. If you're into ETF trading, I want you to take a look at a three-time ETF. It's the E, and I know there's a, a, a ton of ways of trading a market. The ERX, okay? That's a three-time leverage bullish ETF. And the other one is the UC. Oh, that's really horrible handwriting, but I'm sorry. It's the UCO. ERX, that's a three-timer, and this is a two-timer, okay? So when you start to see a bullish bias, when you start to see confirmation that the market's moving, unless you have an order in, it's going to be tough to get into the market. But to take some measuring and profit objectives, I think these two ETFs, they're, they're, it, the interesting aspect, I want to share this with you, um, Let's take a look at UCO real quick. I teed this up. Look at the February. Um, I mean, I mean, granted, it's um, it's got some decent volume as an ETF. It's an eight dollar instrument, right? I mean, today I was down seventy six cents. But look at this, guys. I mean, open interest. Someone's uh, feeling a little love there with a twenty three hundred open interest. Today's volume alone was 800 contracts not a lot but for you know small small uh you know 10 5 15 lot traders that i mean it can handle that type uh bid and ask i mean you gotta admit it's not that bad but here's what i wanted to share with you guys um go out one instead of looking at the feb which is 45 days you might want to look at this april contract you know for an etf that no one seems to be wanting to pay attention to look at today's action there was a, a little bit of a volume right there more so than on the put side on the April uh, a little more bias uh, on the UCO which is a two-time ETF so I just wanted to make sure that you guys had some uh, some information I know that the, the the biggest headline news is crude oil I mean it is something that I would be concerned about I think even if it went to 45 it's a matter of how many minutes will it stay there and I think it behooves us to take a look at that commitment of traders data as well as the uh, essence of the seasonal tendency of supply demand functions of the market just because we all went to had a good time for New Year's and didn't go many people might not have gone where somewhere or whatever we're gonna start to travel soon winter breaks coming up baby people want vacations and you're gonna start to see that travel so don't discount a sharp reversal coming in crude oil you want to be positioned for it and I'm telling you right now we've got some of the best educational information to help you kick 2015 off if you're interested in taking both courses both courses we have a bundle price for you that is just a fabulous value for just four hundred and eighty nine dollars I'm gonna tell you snatch this up you're gonna love it here's the best part I'm gonna get together with all my course members and we're gonna have a one-on-one -on -one webinar together going through the information 
and potential trade setups that have occurred and past trades that have occurred and go through the right selection method and answer all the questions. So the first thing you got to do is you get it. The second thing you got to do is you got to study it. Start the new year off right. And the third thing is you and I get together. We rub elbows in our trading room right here, but we do it in a private mentoring session with me. I'm going to do that, and, and we'll send an email uh, invitation out to all our um, course Buyer. So this is a great way to start the year off. The link's there. I wish you well. I hope you found a lot of uh, uh, insightful information in tonight's presentation. Um, and to be honest with you, I really am excited about 2015. Not the fact that I'm going to be one more year older and the fact that the Y2K is 15 years behind us, but I think it's it's really an enjoyable industry, especially all the, the products that we have the volatility and the uncertainty that's still in the air. And, you know, I just think that we've got some real exciting ways of, of capturing moves. you got 12 months, wait for the right setup, and be well positioned in that trade. Believe in that methodology, and I think you're going to come out way ahead again this year. I want to wish everyone a, not only a prosperous new year, but a healthy new year. And, man, let's get that flu season behind us, shall we? So... That is a bundle package. You have a choice. You can get, uh, by the end of this week, this is going to be the last offer that we have for this year at that price. It's done because I'm only doing one mentoring session with you guys, right? So if you want to get just the PPS indicator combined with person's pivots with all of this analysis right here, if this is what you want, it's only 189 if you want to learn this information combined with my mechanical breakout system strategy, combined is only 489. You get both for 489. So with that said, everyone, have a great evening. We'll send you a link. Enjoy. We did record this. It should be out perfect. It the sound was great. The audience, you guys, were awesome. And uh, I, I think it's uh, it was just a, a nice way to begin the year. So I want to say thank you all very much, and thank you for being here with me because I know, I mean, it is on a Tuesday night, 9 o'clock Eastern Standard Time. You guys have other things to do, I'm sure. So thank you, and I hope you found good value in tonight's information. The link is um, should be posted right there, and uh, I'll put it back in the room. And I hope to see our paths cross if you come out to one of our seminars. Uh, we'll be actually doing a seminar at Aria Casino in May. Uh, we'll be out in Las Vegas doing a uh, typical live trading seminar in May. So I look forward, if anyone's interested in that, you can always visit our website, find out where we'll be. We're going to be at the Money Show. Uh, I'll be speaking about most likely... Uh, you know how some of these trades will work out. We'll talk about what we tweeted out. And for those guys and ladies and gentlemen that took the Twitter trade, what a way to start the new year. Woof. Anyway, it was good stuff. So, um, and, and by the way, I mean, just to, sh just to prove that not all things are bad, the stock market's down 3%. Twitter was up 6.5% today. So anyway, thanks, everybody. Behave. If you don't behave, don't get caught. It's 2015. Live life, man. Be good. Thanks, everyone.